Book four. Revolution. When the world tells you no and you want to say yes. When it says trousers only and you want to wear a dress. When it orders you to be tidy but you can only make a mess. It's time the world needs changing. When it tells you to grow in fear, not to take any notice of what's really happening in here. When it says you call that misery, hold my beer, it's time the world needs changing. When the world tells you to think one way, and you think another. When the world tells you that you can't have a particular lover. When the world tells you to be a father, and you want to be a mother, then the world needs changing. When the world tells you to run off and fight, when the world tells you to stop worrying, but obviously it will be alright. When the world is patient to darkness, but insists that it's light, then the world needs changing. Don't be content to leave things how they are. Issue things will be fixed by some being from some distant star. Stand up tall and tell them, nah. Create the world in which you'd like to live. Remember who you're sharing it with. Always be prepared to give, and chances are everyone else would like to live there too. And the world owes you nothing, it's true, but the people who are on it do. And if you look out for them one day, they might look out for you. 22nd Century Intergalactic Song Contest Entry Earth, place 10th out of 10 planets in 2232. Time was passing at speed, almost too quick to register now that life seemed to be working out at last, but with the uncomfortable feeling that maybe it wouldn't last. Oberon and I had done our best trying to ignore the statue and what it meant, but secretly we both shared a sinking feeling that our little paradise wasn't to last. For now though, all we could do was carry on as close to normal as we could. It was the day of the election. Oberon and Aliath had been busy working on their joint manifesto and Oberon had been reading it to me in preparation of recording a video for the Universal and uploading it that day. It was a tradition on Mars that election candidates only put themselves forward on the very day of the election in order to cut down on corruption. I was impressed. A guarantee of rights for all, the right work for those who want it, when they want it, and the work that nobody wants to do gets a pay rise. No more of this menial jobs for menial duration arts nonsense. Extended trade agreements with other planets, involving a suggestion of mine exporting teller readings to other planets in return for new technology. Offworlders welcomed with open arms and awarded full citizenship. New classes on new planets in the town hall. Greater support for those who need it. More transparency in the decisions public office would have to make. A kinder, gentler government for kinder, gentler times. I don't think it was just my natural bias that told me Oberon was the right duration half of the job. And I like to think that, in some perfect parallel universe somewhere, Prime Minister Oberon got in with a record majority and lived to see a record amount of monthly re-elections. But alas, this was not paradise. Just as our hope was beginning to grow, another daily bulletin brought us back down to Brahms. I speak to you out of great concern for you, my people. A whole month ago now you asked me to form your new government. I heard your concerns, your worries and your fears, and I have done my best to relay them with hard work, passion, and the belief in the people of our wonderful planet. As you may know, my two months in office have discovered many dangerous groups of terrorist off waters literal aliens to our home on Mars, who seek nothing but power for their own evil ends. Many of them have come here freely of their own accord, who despite the warm welcomeness we have given them, they have tried to undermine us with their instruments, to scorn us with their voices, to fight us with violence. This has to stop. <laughs> to that end, I am pleased to announce that there will be no election this month. Indeed, that I will stay in power to keep you safe out of the kindness of my own heart for as long as the threat is deemed necessary. Not as your short term Prime Minister, but as your new king. Rest assured, I will be doing everything in my power to make life fairer for you, my original purebred citizens of Mraz. 
As a result, several new measures will come into effect starting today to make sure that those who live here pull their weight or face deportation. As a result, all off-worlders will now be required to find work through new local job centres, which have been especially established to find the work and packed with the very greatest intelligent and wisdom-filled minds on Mars. All off-worlders, including those already working, will be required to register their place of employment at their local highly staffed, fully equipped job centre in the coming days. Also, any Eurasian caught fraternising with the enemy will now be subject to the same laws as off-worlders, including deportation in extreme cases. It is also our sad duty to inform all of you, due to a number of suspected terrorist incidents linked to off-worlders, from now on all those who vote at the forthcoming elections will be fully vetted, and many of you, even the Eurasianards, may have your ability to vote or stand for office turned down. We stress that this is a measure taken to keep you safe. Oh, and in order to keep up with the latest competition through our competitors, work hours will also be extended by an extra three hours per day. Dear friend, I got into politics because I love this planet and believe in her. We must keep this planet safe and profitable. It is wrong to think that obedience and discipline are only to be desired of our glorious military. They are desired of all of us. Furthermore, I expect you to keep an eye out at all times and keep me posted about anything suspicious you see or hear, especially here. Remember those off-worlders and their helpers may sound as if they are acting for our common good, but we know their intentions better. After all, their first allegiance would always naturally be to the planet they are born on. They are not one of us. They do not deserve to be treated as one of us. Dear citizens, I salute you. I will fear out. There was a pause while Oberon and I stared at each other hopelessly and struggled to take in the news. I watched all our great dreams and hopes dissolve like Auntie C's tea bags. Well, that's it then, said Oberon, looking uncharacteristically defeated. Not to get too lethophobic about this, but that's our counter-attack over. There are no elections. I can't stand against Almathea. All the off-worlders would be too busy working to play in our band. Come to that, so will I. Oh, and we're both going to be deported for good measure. I hope they're kind of to Eurasian arts on Earth and Mirage is to humans. But the voting, I said, shocked. There'll be an outcry, surely. Oberon looked thoughtful. I honestly don't know. We've never had a ruler try and stay in power before. I had a feeling Almathia would try and bar me from standing against him somehow. But to stop anyone standing against him, that's monstrous. People will get sick of it, though, won't they, Oberon? If Almathia never stands down. In time, I'm sure you're right, Eleanor. But he's already blocked a slot from trying to vote. Who's to say that by the time the next election comes around, he won't have somehow prevented everyone from voting who stood against him last time? But that's nearly half a planet, I spluttered. Surely there'll be an outcry. Oh, I'm sure there will, said Oberon. But everyone who cries out will be labelled a subversive, and any inquiry launched into what happened will take years, long enough for the government to do so much damage we won't even remember the fact they took our right to vote from us, away from us, once it's been replaced by something so much worse. I'd like to think people will see through it all, especially given the reaction we got from our performance. But I worry too that many people will give Almathea the benefit of the doubt for now, and believe everything he says. After all, having such a lying toe rag in charge of us is so new on Mars. But, 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 they, they can't, I spluttered. They just can't. We haven't done anything wrong. A king, too, asked Oberon at the exact same time. An unelected king? That's an outdated Earth idea, not a Eurasian one. It's an accepted fact on this planet that everyone is equal and has the right for a chance to govern. To discard a political system that has been in place for quadzillions of years. That's monstrous. What do we do, Oberon? Should we go and kick his statue in? We better not, said Oberon. For now I think Jeremy is right. The less trouble we cause right now, and the less chances Almathea has to attack us, the better. Let's go and see the planetary ambassadors instead, and see what they can do, starting with the one from Earth. I'm sure back home will be horrified at what's happening, and try to stop it. Come on, E. 
We walked to the Earth Ambassador's office, my shorter legs struggling to keep up with Oberon as he strode out ahead of me, as full as anger as I had ever seen his usually placid self. To our great shock and horror, the Earth Ambassador's office that I had visited so often just two short months ago was not there, and the office that had once been stuffed with every conceivable bit of equipment available to the modern Merasian was now a simple white building, empty except for the Merasian flag fluttering in the breeze of an empty window and a sign saying Offworld Job Centre, Earthling Department. We both goggled and looked around as if making sure we hadn't got lost, but of course we hadn't. Well, at least I knew where I would have to go later for my work appointment. Oberon and I then decided to check every other ambassador's office from all the other eight planets, and they were all the same. As we walked, I remembered what Oberon had said to me once, that flags only became important to a culture one interest in themselves was flagging, but people who waved them somehow felt that if they could put all that energy into waving it under the nose of their victims, then it would cow them into obedience, when really it just made them an anachronism, waving a bit of felt cloth in the breeze in the face of technology and progress. People who really loved their country, they didn't need a flag to prove it, they felt it, and what they never understood was the fact that people who want to live in the same place that their flag was waved was the biggest tribute that any being could possibly give them. Eventually we grabbed hold of an underwing that Oberon recognised as a junior filing clerk he had known from school. The Merasianard, whose name was Karin Erinan, looked genuinely scared when Oberon walked up to her, and she muttered something about wanting to keep her job by not talking to strange off-worlders, but Oberon was insistent and asked where the ambassadors had been moved to. They haven't been moved, she squeaked. There are no ambassadors anymore. Their jobs have been merged into another. When pressed, she admitted that their merged jobs now consisted of doing the junior filing alongside her on the other side of the planet. Disgusted, Oberon turned round to leave. I know she's only trying to keep a job, and it's not her fault. But honestly, Jeremy has so much more guts than her in his tiny tail, Oberon barked. Right, I'm going to send a message to the Intergalactic Peace Federation, and I'm going to address it above the heads of our Bellabrat friend this time. We marched home in dull silence, so different to our usual joking, laughing, chattering and singing, that it felt like the end of the world already. Out of the corner of my eye I could see Moration Art standing away from us, and half afraid we would do something to them on the streets. Some looked apologetic, some fierce. Some confused, as if wondering how a species as short as mine could possibly be the danger their beloved leader had outlined. It was all so different to the cheering and enthusiasm that greeted our performance. I could hardly believe that it was the same planet. Still, the Merasian arts were only scared of what might happen to them if they spoke out of line, and I knew well what that felt like. Why should they risk all to help strange off-world beings that they had never even met? The problem was, of course, that if Almathir's wicked scheme was allowed to run for long enough, then he would only come after them too. Finally, we got home. Waiting for us was the next postal delivery. A few stray odds and ends from other planets still praising us for our singing, but it seemed obsolete now. Alongside an official letter containing a written statement with instructions similar to the daily bulletin audio, just in case any citizen had missed it, and my job sent to call at papers. While I was reading through them, I had an appointment that very afternoon. Oberon rushed up to the Universal and composed his letter. I heard him make several sighs and anguish cries, which were all very un oberon like so eventually joined him upstairs. Every message I send gets answered by that same blasted Bella Brat, he exclaimed. All he does is tell me how lucky I am to be living on this very wonderful planet with such wonderful people and the finest cakes in all the universe. Also, he seems to have been given a sudden and most unexpected promotion, to the point where no one else is qualified enough to answer my queries. The odd thing is, though, I've asked my friend in Camelosia to send a message for me, and they've got someone else fine. It's only when they mention they're asking on my behalf to get stonewalled and sent to the same Bella Brat. Something tells me our Bella Brat friend was given something more than just cakes. I'm willing to bet that's where some of the surplus money we Merasian arts have created this past month has gone and the ambassador's cake habit is their means of getting to him and keeping him quiet. I watched Oberon's shoulders slump in defeat. Don't worry, I said. We can defeat them somehow. We can play more concerts. We can get word out to the BCBC. They can't do this to us. Oberon pressed his forehead into mine. Thank you, E. 
but it's my job to keep you, both of you now, safe. And I can't. It's my job to keep you safe too, I said. Maybe if we play along we'll get tired and see we aren't a threat. Maybe, said Oberon, as unconvinced as me. Travelling the BCBC on, I said. Hearing some intergalactic news or colourful music from outside this wretched planet will make us feel better. But it didn't. Instead, there was a story about how Mraz's profits had grown exponentially during the past month, a profile of Almathea's rise to power, and a further mention of how his success had inspired other planetary leaders to do the same thing. We listened, aghast, for an hour, as we got one piece of propaganda after another, full-on pieces about how Mraz's economy had risen, and how the other planets had had to raise their game accordingly. This wasn't a game to us, though. This is the rest of our lives hanging in the balance. There was no mention of any suffering, of off-world of plight, of cooperation between planets. There wasn't even any music from any world played anymore, just a long, slow, static cacophony of lies and mistruths. The worst of all this was hearing that other planets were doing the same thing. Did that mean everyone was destined to spend the rest of their lives on the same planet they were born on, forever? Had anyone you been listening in that day, they would have assumed that none of the ten planets had ever made contact at all that all of them were bitter enemies rather than subdued friends, and that the events in endurance had never happened. I strained to listen to the sounds of some great revolt outside, some great mass rebellion telling Almathir and his cronies where they could stuff their short-sighted policies, to hear outrage at the way he had taken over not just the planet of the Peace Federation, but also the symbol of hope to the oppressed round the universe, the broadcast of the united so many souls on so many different planets. Instead... There was nothing. After all, I suppose later on reflection, how many people in the world did it directly affect? Twenty of us? Thirty? Not even that? All of them scattered amongst an Eurasian art population like confetti. Oberon and I knew, though, right then, that our way of life was over, in the time it took to complete a sentence, that if Almathir had taken over the biggest source of intergalactic media, then they truly owned everything. All it would take for the lives of those around them to change too would be more bulletins in the coming days, weeks, months and years to cement the fact that off-worlders were unwelcome and we were all in one big competition rather than the cooperation we had dreamed of. Worse may yet be to come though, for once a leader turns on members of their own population that they are sworn to uphold and protect, however small in number and influence they may be, then the pattern is always that the leader would turn on others too all those that disagree, then those that are different, then those that don't work in the way the leaders would like, then those that don't work hard enough, until the only people who are left are the leaders, their friends and their family. The universe would again become more about who you knew, rather than what you knew, something that seemed far more alien to me after living on Mars, and experiencing how education and curiosity drove their way of life, than it would have done coming direct from Earth. I had seen this cycle played out so many times across our history, but of course Mraz was new to all this, and didn't know what was coming. I saw such misery, not just in my future, but the future of a planet I had fallen in love with, and come to call home, and wept. Almathea was wrong. My allegiance wasn't to Earth anymore. It was to saving the planet of the people I had so fallen in love with. But it felt like there was nothing else I could do. Soon it was time for my job centre appointment. I'd even had to explain to Oberon what a job centre was. On Mraz people didn't need to advertise for jobs, and there was always plenty of work for those who wanted it, as well as a means not to have one for those who wanted to better their time studying or thinking. It was, he said, a very Earth concept. The idea that all the best jobs went to friends and family of those who had them, but that some jobs were so poor and low quality, the only way people could be made to do the jobs no one else wanted to do was through the trade of bits of green paper that were worthless on their own, or through being forced to do them under pain of starvation. Oberon tried to come with me, worried about my safety, but now I was equally worried about his, and the line on the bulletin about Eurasian art seemed fraternising with the enemy. If Almathea had the power to corrupt BCBC, then they surely had eyes and ears everywhere. Better to survive just a little bit longer, until he could work out what to do for the best. I didn't mean that I had to be happy about it, though, or make it easy on the people doing their best to make my life difficult. 
So it was for overcoming my nerves as best I could. I found myself at the job centre for the second time that day, alone. Contrary to the bulletin, it was not fully equipped or generously staffed. Instead, there was a single fierce-looking Eurasian aunt who looked down her long Eurasian nose at me, sitting at one very retro-looking edition of the Universal. Sit down, she said, although the only chair here was Eurasian size and impossibly big for me to get into properly, so I just sort of folded myself up in it. Where do you work? I was asked. Well, I said, I was working as a lecturer at the town hall. That was before you shut down my classes. Then I was working as a musician, an unofficial peace delegate, spreading hope and peace to the galaxy. Apparently that was seen as a form of protest and banned. I also work as an assistant at the Kola Walla Buddha Club Kitchens when they're busy, and staff are needed, but I suppose you're going to take that away from me too. I hadn't meant to get riled so early on in our meeting, but it was how hard not to. Just being here, in this environment, with everyone and everything designed to look down on you, to assume that you were trying to pull a fast one instead of being in genuine need was enough to make you lose your temper. The Lady Marasian art of the horn rimmed glasses didn't even look up from her paperwork as she spoke aloud in tandem with what she was writing. No current job. Well, she said, looking at me square in the eyes, which wasn't easy from her height. You must find one, you know. Or well, do you think I could have one of the jobs I was doing back again? No. I am an expectant mother, I said, playing for sympathy. Will that make a difference? Is there any maternity leave under this government? No, she said simply. If this Marasian art had been an earth woman, I would have sworn she would have rolled her eyes at this fact for good measure. I thought not. OK, then. Well, could you help me find one similar to what I used to do on earth? She put down her writing. Madam, it is not my job to find you a job. It is your job to find you a job. And if you don't find a job within a reasonable time frame, say, a couple of weeks, you get deported. It's as simple as that. We can't afford to house or feed you the way things are. Mars is in dire financial straits, after all, due to the previous 7,000 lax government. Well, I said, I have a problem with that. You see, given one of the old bulletins on the Universal, apparently I'm not supposed to approach strangers, and I've already worked for most of the Eurasian arts I know. Not to mention the fact that, according to the BCBC, Mars made a surplus this past month, so my work isn't strictly necessary. Not really my problem, she said, folding her wings at the other end of the table. Well, I said, it is. Mostly because without help I can't find a job, and that means you won't be able to tick me off on your paperwork, and your job will be seen as unnecessary, and I will tell everyone that you refuse me work and it will look really bad on you. She sighed, temporarily giving in. What sort of job are you looking for, exactly? I was a bookkeeper in my old job on Earth. Off-world jobs helping aliens don't count. What sort of job do you want here? Any, really. I'm not fussy. As long as you bear in mind that I don't have the intuitive skills of Eurasian arts, so putting me anywhere near a teller job would probably be a bad idea. Oh, and physically humans really aren't as strong as Eurasian arts, or anywhere near as coordinated, so something more intellectual would be better. And what sort of things are you good at? She said. Well, organising, planning, communicating, empathy with others, working as a team, using my own initiative, seeing tasks through to completion. I'm rather good at keeping files, like I say. Always did my tax returns on the earliest day I could meet. General bookkeeping, writing. I'm a dab hand with numbers. I think I'm quite good at looking after customers. I play several musical instruments from several different planets now. And I'm fairly proficient with the local technology now I've got used to it. Well, she said without irony. Not much then that I can see. I can only find one job that will fit you. Here's your spade. There's a trench we want you to dig. Starting tomorrow. Oh, there'll be a pay cut for your first 30 years, given that you're an off-world in. We have to get our money back somehow, you know. But in my spade over my shoulder, I fumed and turned to walk away accidentally knocking everything on my advisor's desk over as I went. <coughs> Oops, sorry, I said, but if you will insist on giving me physical jobs to do. I'm only human, after all. I marched back to our house, bumping into Auntie C along the way, outside an official-looking building that used to be the Ziggurus Free Ambassadors. What's with the spade? Are you taking up gardening, dear? asked Auntie C. 
I've always thought how conducive the sunlight on Mars is to building up a glorious variation of plant life, from the tokia trees to the fazandula bushes and the hosterian shrubs. There's such a colourful array of plants to get not like back on vigorous free. There's too much sunlight outside of the caves and not enough inside the caves. I've always admired Earth horticulture. No, I said sadly. Apparently now all off-worlders need some sort of job or we're to be deported. Did you hear the bulletin today? No, dear, said Auntie C. Or read your post? No, dear. I knew how important it was to vote, so I came out early to make sure our fear got a whopping. For some reason, the Universal doesn't seem to be working the way it did last month, but I know my rights, and I can go along to my ambassador and vote in person in the booth if they check my papers. I seem to be here too early, though. The ambassador's office doesn't seem to be open. I hope they haven't changed anything. It was hard enough my first month being registered and proving that I was who I said I was. They said that all climate spots look the same to them, even though I'm the only one currently living on Mars, which I thought was a bit of a giveaway. We can't vote, I said in a quiet voice. We're not allowed. As I already explained to you, madam, said an official voice as a head I didn't recognise put itself through a window. But you keep interrupting me. Come, vote. Can't vote, I'll have you no sooner than I'm 71,365 years on my home world, and even on this one I'm over 20, and you can vote from the age of five here. Can't vote while well, you might as well tell me I can't breathe, or drink tea, or tickle my pet charge, you brave, or... Madam, it's not a case of age, but convenient. I'm afraid you wouldn't be able to fit in the voting booth, even if off-worlders were allowed to vote anymore, which they aren't. Now listen here, whippersnapper. Like Oberon, Clandersprout had a habit of picking up old earth slang and losing it to their advantage, I had noticed. I'm a fully paid up citizen of this planet and I have a great deal of taxes to pay. Or do I? So let me and we'll both be happy. I'm afraid the booze were built for the ration hours, not Clandersprout. And according to this official bit of paper I was handed this morning, off are not allowed to vote at all. Instead, this ambassador's office has been closed and converted into a job cell for the citizens formerly of Zigorous Free. So there is nowhere for you to know it. But I already work, and I'm the only person here from Zigorous Free, said Auntie C. I knit anything in Asian art, requests and take commissions. I've had hundreds of happy customers you could check on the Universal. That is no longer considered a proper job, madam, said the official. You will be providing with a new one that will better fit the needs of the Eurasian economy. You'll soon consider it a need when it gets to winter around here and you have nothing on your head to keep you warm, snapped Auntie C. I was already to knit you one, but instead I see you're in it already. Madam, our economy needs an economic lift in more ways than wooden apparel. We are in fierce competition with the McGrunks and Camelosians and Elephants. We need proper jobs to stimulate our economy. No, we're not, I yell. We aren't in competition with anybody. The economy has been fine for all ten planets past century. We trade and cooperate. We don't need to compete. Our fear is king and not you, and this is an end to the matter, said the official to both of us before turning to Auntie C. Go home and check your mail for when you will be back here forthwith. And with that, the window was slammed in our faces. What's going on? asked Auntie C, bewildered. So I took her by the hand and told her everything that had happened that day. Why? she said. For the sake of us singing a few songs, did we give wind of Oberon and Ali of standing for election? Are they really that scared of us? Yes, and greedy with it, I nodded, as we walked home past the fountain in the park. Best we stay out of sight for now, but I can't help but get mad and emotional with these people. Wait, said Auntie C, staring at the fountain. And my old clandus brown eyes playing tricks, there's not a Moorasian out of there. Oh yes, I thought to myself. That was a few problems back, and I'd already forgotten all about it. I mean, trained myself not to look at it. Yes, I said sadly. It looks as if Alma Thea replaced the statue of Enwin and Lizzie with one of himself a few days ago. But that's monstrous! Auntie C shouted, with such venom compared to her usual dulcet tones, it took me by surprise. Enwin and Lizzie gave their lives so that we might explore the universe together! To off-worlders like us, they represent all those unspoken agreements, like free travel, free trade, and free liberty for all species, for all times, not just when it's economically convenient to a leader that's greedy for money and power. 
I to take that away is as good as declaring war on all of us non Eurasians. Why couldn't that great elf set up a statue of his own next to him if he wanted one this badly? I realise that Auntie C had genuinely been oblivious to all the changes that had been taking place on Mars the past few months and tried to break the news about what Oberon and I thought was really going on to her as gently as I could. She was horrified. Then what, what does that, that mean for all of us off-worlders? I really admire Mars and have longed to come to this planet for most of my life. That's the only one of the ten more civilised in my own world. No offence, love. But to have that one man take away everything from us like that, it's not a raging artist way of anything. It's, it's human. No offence again, dear. I couldn't help but agree with her. It was human-like. It was part of our past I hoped had been left behind for good, from the bad old days of the 20th and early 21st centuries, when greed and cronyism and corruption were rife and nobody seemed to be doing anything about it. Sadly, there might not be any more band practice for a while, I told her. I hope you get a spade along with me, that way we can work together, and it won't be so bad. Suddenly remembering my even more important news, I stopped in the road. Oh yes, events of the past day have moved on so fast, I think almost forgot to tell you. You were right, I'm pregnant, and you're going to be a sprod parent. Oh my dear, said Auntie C, sweeping me up into her arms. That's such a wonderful news. Even with everything else going on, that's too brilliant for words, even for a bloody spot. I know what great parents you both will be, and what a wonderful future our offspring will have one day. Everything that's happening now is a short-term problem that could be fixed someday, somehow, with a child. That gives one hope forever, and the idea that somehow, some way, things will always get better. For all my pain and grief, I couldn't help but agree with her and hugged her back. Maybe things would be all right now, despite all my doubts. Time passed in an unladylike crawl. The way time always does when you aren't enjoying yourself anymore. Without band practice, my days were long and empty and directionless, made all the worse by the hard work I was now putting in, all in order to avoid being deported. As it turned out, all of the off-worlders had been given the same job as me, digging ditches, and a new road out of the back of the government headquarters, where they could keep an eye on us, I guessed. That all made a mockery of having job centre appointments in the first place, but I quickly realised that it was all just window dressing to make what Alma Fia was doing look better to the Eurasian arts who didn't have to go there. Eight thirteenths of the intergalactic players who had been on top of the universe mere weeks ago now found ourselves reunited, shovels in hand, singing not as we took down the corrupt system, but as we worked instead. Even the off-worlders who hadn't been in our band and who we had met during our tests joined in with our singing. Given my condition, the others very sweetly rallied around me and saved me from doing the worst of the digging, though I tried to do my part as best I could. It was cruel, hard, heavy work that wore us out. While we were working our socks off, the daily bulletins raged hard and fiercely all the time, with some new insult about how we weren't working hard enough, or some new instruction as to how to help make Mars make more money, even though all of us knew it was a con, and that funds were instead being siphoned out to the BCBC, an intergalactic peace federation. The BCBC broadcast continued to be full of empty rhetoric, full of how this planet and that planet were doing economically or politically, but especially Mars, with no time left for broadcasts of music or dramas or poetry or literature the way there had been. The universe had never seemed so small or petty-minded. I had never felt so small set against it too. However, as my depression grew, so did my tummy. And for our many sadnesses, there were two things that kept me going. Oberon and my unborn child. During that time, we grew closer than ever, having all the conversations that we had meant to have, but had never got round to in our first two months together. I spoke to his family via the Universal, and he even spoke to mine briefly, but with the Earth time lag of nearly an hour that made conversation difficult. Still, I felt better knowing that our families were intertwined, and all knew about our happy news and to my relief both sides have been really pleased for us, more concerned with our child's happiness and the environment they would grow up in, rather than what they would look like, or stereotypical views of how they would act, which was, after all, how it should be. Never one to turn down an opportunity for learning, Oberon had also buried himself in books about parenting, from both Earth and Eurasian points of view, which he read while I slept, often at the same time. 
though a pittance, for meagre extra income from my job, and Oberon's increased hours at the Collar Wallabula Cafe had also enabled us to add an extension onto our house, with a whole new floor which we turned into a bedroom for the baby. We had great fun painting the walls, with Mars imagery on one side and Earth imagery on the other, so our child would always know about their joint heritage, with two walls connected by an invisible chain that glowed at night when the light shone on it the right way. My pregnancy was an endless force of fascination to Oberon, and I soon learnt all the ways in which human pregnancies were different to the Merasian sort. One day I'd noticed him staring at me intensely, so I asked him what he was thinking. Embarrassed Oberon said, I was just wondering where the egg would come out. It turned out that his textbook on Earth families had not done the best research, and had got humans confused with reptiles. Easily done, Oberon thought, until I explained to him, apparently, as our only fellow mammals, only glad the hardest gave birth the same way. Next, Oberon became alarmed at my amount of morning sickness, which Murasian arts never had. Convinced I was seriously ill, he called the tiny medical section of the Universal up several times before I got him to stop. Oh, he said, shamefaced one day, it's just that on Mars nobody gets sick when they're pregnant. They just turn a different colour depending on the aura of the child they are carrying. Purple for a boy, roulette for a girl, so the old Murasian wives' tales have it. But nobody seriously believes that. Next he became concerned about my cravings and the odd combination of meals I was having from the aliment producer. Her food is odd at the best of times, he said, but are you sure that's wise? I even started getting a craving for his gnarworm burgers, much to his mock annoyance as there never seemed to be enough left over for him. Mostly though he worried about how quickly I was ballooning up. I have to say it worried me too. It was pregnancy even last the usual nine months. I guess, being a Merasian art, it would be a bigger baby than a human one, I said haltingly. Well, it's an odd thing, said Oberon, but it appears from the books I've, I've been reading that babies of all ten species start off life as roughly the same size in the womb. They just grow at different speeds after birth. The next thing the baby did was start humming. Not with his vocal cords, though. that would have been weird. Instead, it was almost a mechanical sort of sound, a background noise as if something was running a little like the Universal did when the rest of the house was quiet. Alarmed, we consulted everything we could find in case it was a sign of a problem. But we could never find one, and in the end we put it down to one of our offspring's little quirks. Well, said Auntie C when she heard it for herself one day while on a visit, it's a baby that belongs to the two of you. It was never going to be completely normal, now was it, dear? There was one other subject we had both been avoiding, perhaps because we didn't want to tempt fate, even though Oberon had already read the baby's fortune multiple times for possible dates between now and a month past the due date, and all had proven to be rather good, some of the dates especially so. What do we call him or her? I can't remember now who said it first, but I know we were both thinking it. So I asked Oberon what usually happened on Mars. I don't know what the traditions are on Earth, but it is common on Mars to take the names of both her parents, each word fused together to create a whole new one that belongs uniquely to our offspring. You might have noticed that older Merasian arts tend to have shorter names, as they have less generations to be born from. We think if you go back far enough in time, all Merasian art names consisted of one letter, which is why everyone here seems to insist on calling you E. Mm, let's see, that would make our child Obanor, or Eleron. Mm, it does work rather better with pure Merasian art names. I myself am named for my parents, Oba Jonas and Haveron, who in turn were named for Bijon and Horus, plus Havamil and Beron. We would be got by. I rather like Eleron, I said swiftly, acutely aware now of how easily a Merasian art could embark on an uninterruptible monomark. An Eleron it is, said Oberon. I rather like it. It's both earthly and merasian -y, all at the same time. It's certainly unique, I should think. A unique name for a unique baby, I said, patting my tummy and lying back on Oberon's wings. I wonder how he or she will cope with being the only one of their kind. The only one of their kind so far, said Oberon, smiling. I'm willing to bet there'll be a whole universe full of hybrids out there in the universe before too many years. After all, love and passion are about the only thing stronger than a governmental law. Even Almathea can't stop that. Before Eleron arrived, though, there was one last turn of events to come. So far all of us off-worlders had played safe and done everything that the racist party had asked of us. 
turning up to our jobs and not mixing with any Eurasian arts outside our friends in the band and paying our new higher taxes on time and generally being very well behaved indeed. You wouldn't know that from the bulletins though, which blamed us for every single problem, no matter how slight or ridiculous. Lower planetary profits are normal, nothing to do with the Bella Brats of the Peace Federation asking for money of course, oh no, that was because the off-worlders were slacking off. An accident, we were responsible, despite all of us being a half planet away sometimes. Bad weather, that was surely our singing. The BCBC was no help either, and we had long ago stopped turning it on, full as it was of reports we knew were false when they concerned Mars, and leaving us far from confident that reports of other planets doing economically brilliantly were true. Finally, though, enough was enough, and this bulletin made our blood run cold, even Oberon's, whose blood was already cold. All forms of protest, including the performance of subversive songs, have now been banned. From now on, all protests are banned under Section 4A of the New Public Orders Act. This includes holding signs, singing, chanting, obstructing officials and marching. We will strengthen the powers of our newly created police force to tackle protests that have a significant disruptive effect on the public. This bill gives police the power to impose conditions on public assemblies if the noise generated by those taking part results in serious disruption due to activities taking place in the vicinity. Police can intervene if there is any risk of disruption or disturbance. The forces are also given the right to move unauthorised encampments of any kind. You will all, of course, be given access to freedom of expression, just when no one is there to listen and be corrupted by your subversive messages. But, 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 spluttered Oberon when he heard the news. That's a Eurasian given right, our oldest right. I'd like to think we invented protest, though I'm sure other planets would like to make that claim too. I don't care what so-called calamity caused this, you can't possibly stop us protesting over everything. At least we still have a universal, to let people know what's really going on. Breaking news. Henceforth, the Universal will be banned to all off-worlders and their accomplices. We both groaned. That's awful, said Oberon. Now I won't be able to stay in direct contact with anyone, or read up on their day, or go back through my old files. It's totally designed to keep you off-worlders further and further apart from us. We'll just have to go back to doing things the old-fashioned earthed way. By talking, I said. I've had enough of hiding in the shadows. Things are only getting worse, Oberon. We have to fight back some way, even if all we do is remind the Eurasian arts that we're still here and we're still suffering. Hark at you, grinned Oberon. Is this really the same timid earth girl I met all those months ago? Well, really, I replied, we have to do something. We can't bring our child up on a planet like this. If we don't do something soon, then we won't have any more rights to take away. And being good and quiet and doing what they say doesn't seem to be working out too well. The bulletin tone flashed again, and the universal plunged back into life. We both groaned. They really do seem to be picking on us today, I added. Breaking news. A subversive club to Hardit named Jeremy is being held for insolence and insubordination. His trial will be televised soon. This time we both shrieked. What the deuce? spluttered Oberon. Poor Jeremy, I said. He must be so scared right now. Of all the off-worlders to pick on. Well, that settles it, said Oberon. I know they're lying now. Fancy accusing a glabda harlot of standing up to someone in authority. Anyone who knows any of them personally would know how unlikely that is. They've just chosen one of us as a message to scare the rest of us, to try to crush our spirit. Well, it's working. I guess most of Mraz have never met a glabda harlot, I said, almost relishing the idea of a fight after several months of being as good as I could be. Well, we clearly have to fight back now. There's no way we're going to leave Jeremy to rot in some prison, and I'm guessing Almathea knows that only too well. He's trying to force us to react. I think it's high time we got the intergalactic peace band out of hibernation. Even if it means deportation. To you and our child. Of course, I would follow on immediately, but they might not give me a chance to go with you. For Jeremy, of course. I hate to think of our poor little friend trying to hide in his cell, but having no table to hide under. He must be so lonely and afraid right now. And I think we've reached the point where mass deportation is the next thing we'll do anyway, I said sadly. I'm half surprised they haven't already. 
I'm already on several last warnings for not working hard enough, for not earning enough money, for having nefarious relations with a local. That's you, Oberon. I guess poor Jeremy just had one too many. It was rather nefarious, wasn't it? Oberon said. And fun. Well, I guess if they're going to get us, they might as well get us for something we did do this time. Time for a rally. Or an ambuscade, perhaps. Poor Jeremy, he must be so afeared. And who knows, I would imagine a large chunk of Mraz are getting as sick of all this as we are. It's the Universal that's done it. Alma Fear must be on it every night talking about us now he's kicked us off it. No wonder he's turned so many people against us. We have no chance to put our side of the story forward. We don't necessarily need the Universal, though. Not with the amount of noise we're going to make now. At worst, we'll end up in the cells next to Jeremy to keep him company. Plus, they asked for it. Oberon fought heavily, frowning his usual thoughtful frown. If only we had a version of the Universal we could use to get lots of people's attention at once, then we'd get Mraz together behind us and show them all. I suddenly shot out of my chair. The latest fast track Valdivian slot from Earth. Was it today? Yes, I think so. Why are you trying to order more gluten? No, you'll see, I said. I see the Universal has been switched off to us in all ways that don't make money. The Eurasian taxes on our packages nowadays are astronomical. I sat down next to Oberon again. I really do think it's worth getting the band back together, or as many as will come. Thirteen of us won't be enough to storm the prison on our own. But we saw after our broadcast how many people are on our side, really, if we can talk to them. The more of us making a noise to bring them out of their houses, the better. They can't arrest us all. Oberon grinned. You're thinking I like a Merasian art tonight, Eleanor. Before I contact the band, though, one thought's just occurred to me. What happened on your planet for protesting? If Alma Fear is copying Earth concepts, so we need to know as much as possible about what he might do next. Jail time, maybe, alongside Jeremy. More likely a fine. What sort of things did Earthlings campaign against? It sounds as if your planet had a lot. Well, all sorts of things were considered unfair. Wars that pitted one part of a planet against another. Unfair treatment of persecuted minorities. That other people got more paid more than we did, whether it was because of class, gender, race or age. Corruption when the people in charge broke too many of the rules they made themselves. Oberon whistled at this. For that you got fined. As in made to pay money. For protesting that you weren't being paid enough. Yep, welcome to Earth. And you put up with all that. Humans are insane. Nope. Why? What did you do about it? We protested. There was a pause whilst Oberon tried to think through the logic of his statement several times over and failed. It's sneaky of them to kill the Universal to us all. I'll go and contact the others the old-fashioned way. It's a good job I know everyone's address. Photographic memory, me. I taught myself how to do it years ago, just in case it was ever useful. In time, Oberon and I met up with all the band. We had expected to have to make quite an argument, but in no time at all it was agreed that we should get back together again and protest. All the intergalactic players had fought much the same as the two of us, and were very pleased to actually be doing something about things again, however hopeless our stance might end up being. We were all worried for Jeremy. We knew how afraid and anxious any of us would be, but times out by a hundred for a glab to hard it, a species that would never knowingly speak out of turn or risk trouble. It was all we could do to stop Brenda storming the prison then and there, while even Mariana's cold hard logic agreed with us that things were only going to get worse if we didn't take a stand. We thought that Auntie C might be the hardest to win over, given her nervousness at risking deportation, the fact that she had been on Mars longer than any of us off-worlders, but she was so cross about what they had done to Jeremy, she was shaking with rage, which was quite a sight in a clandestine. But none of us fancied deportation, and losing the homes we had made here, we all of us cared enough about our friend and our world to stand up and speak out on its behalf, which was ironic when you thought about it. Had we been the interlopers that the racist government said we were, we would all have pulled off home a long time ago already. We ran over our plan. Last time the Marasian arts had been inspired enough by our music to come out in huge crowds, and we had been kicking ourselves for not harnessing them sooner. Surely this time they would come out again and maybe some of them would back us up when we told them what was really going on behind Almathea's lies on the Universal and help us march on the jail and put things right. We met in secret at the Collawallabula Club, disappearing in ones, twos and threes after work. It felt really good and surprisingly easy to play together again, 
to be doing something instead of passively waiting for the bulletin messages to come in. Most of us have been playing for fun in private, of course, but playing solo is a very different prospect to playing as a band, especially one that hadn't dared meet up for so long. Relearning something is much easier the second time round, though, and with Oberon there to sort us out, we were soon sounding good again, or at any rate good enough for an impromptu walkabout protest in the town square. It's not like the broadcast, Oberon kept reminding us. We don't have to be perfect this time, just as long as we make enough noise to make everyone hear us. One rehearsal was enough. Not wanting to make Jeremy wait any longer, the next day we made our plans, and we're ready. Post, said Oberon the next morning. But we don't get post. Not since the fan letters fizzled out anyway. The post Moravian art is too afraid to even put bills through our door these days. I recognise that shape. I think it's the Earth megaphone I sent off for, I said. Mega what? said Oberon. It's an Earth invention, I said. It makes your voice sound really loud. We'll be heard from miles away. How oh, very Earth-like, Oberon shuddered. I can see sometimes where you came to Mraz to give your ears a rest. I'm surprised you didn't confiscate it. The Universal yesterday said there'd been a clampdown on outside mail. They probably didn't know what it was, to be fair, I replied. Maybe they thought it created gluten or something. How does it work? asked Oberon, as I tore the wrapping off as fast as I could. Shut your ears a second, my love, I said, knowing how much Oberon, and indeed most Moravian arts come to that, were startled by loud noises. I held the megaphone to my lips and spoke into it. It works like this. Wow, that'll get you some attention in the Moravian Art High Street for certain. Are you sure it's a good idea? How else can I get people to listen without using the Universal? Had this all happened on Earth, I'd have been arrested straight away for disturbing the peace. But so few people ever disturb the peace here that they won't have a clue what to do with me. By then I'll have the crowd eating out of my hand. Eating out of your what? Oh, oh, good, said Oberon, his ears still ringing, as the translator circuits caught him. They always took a bit longer for slang and colloquialisms, it seemed. All twelve of us met up, each of us looking worried and concerned, even the habitat. We knew it was now or never, and so it was that the intergalactic peace band rode again one last time, walking out to the former endurance fountain in the town park, where so much pedestrian traffic passed every day, and playing an instrumental version of We Are All One Planet, with me chanting at the top of my voice. Free our Eurasian brother Jeremy, who has been locked up despite committing no crime. Down with the racist government, who want to banish off worlders and take away our rights. Down with kings, bring back democracy. Every citizen has the right to a peaceful protest. Stood right, joined the Nazi C, enjoying herself. No jail for Jeremy. The racial arts have a heart. The lovers want to do no more jobs. Human beings strike until our friend is a free. Bella Brooks walk out from love to heart and say no, we're on a go slow. Have we done on holiday? Camelosians and Sabinosians. Dewsbury giants will not be compiled. Like rubber safe and rubber to the racist bunk. Figuring Auntie C was more of a natural speaking slogans incessantly for me, I quickly handed her the megaphone, showed her how to use it, and picked up a mythologian instead. We might regret showing her how to use that, joked Oberon as he scooted round to see me in the gap between songs. I don't think we'll ever get it back off her again. Our music, stroke shouting, soon brought out a crowd. Most of the Moravian arts looked more amused than anything. As time went on, it became clear that a number of the crowd understood what we were doing and, who knows, may have had their own doubts about the Moravian party, and Alma Fia confirmed. Before too long, quite a large crowd had gathered around us, and quite a lot of that were chanting or singing along with us. Some were chanting, Shame! Others, Save the club to harness! Others for Alma Fia was an, Oh, misery guts I'd never voted for in the first place! Within the space of a few minutes, Mars had gone from being a docile planet of well-behaved citizens into a throbbing mass of delinquency. How much, I wondered, had Alma Fia overestimated his hold on these crowds, who had all clearly thought like us about what was happening to their planet. They just needed somebody else to make the first move to make them feel safer. We also started singing a new song we had learned for the occasion, an old Moravian number outlining their inalienable right to protest, in the hope that some of the Moravian arts in the crowd might remember.
tell us to be quiet, assuming that we'll just go away, turn our backs on injustice and not come back another day. But the politicians are the enemies, the world leaders are our foes. We'd all get along quite well if we met up one day, you know. to say is justified as right of reply when someone lies. It's only fair to let us show we care. You tell us to stand down, hope we'll all be quiet. You hope we'll give up, or we hope for a riot. Today it's a stalemate, but you bet we'll be back. If our needs aren't met, and you still give us the sack. Right to fight a cause that's just. If you try to silence us, then fight back we must. When all we have is our voice and our words, then it is our right to tell everyone until you've all heard. patience with you being annoyed. We got that way first with what you did to us. It's our legal right to make a big old fuss. By now we had amassed quite a crowd of Mauritian arts, most of whom were clearly on our side. Inevitably though, our march didn't just attract the attention of the public, but officials as well. Soon a Mauritian art that Oberon recognised as the self-appointed General Wabaloft, and until recently a laughing stock given the traditional lack of a military presence on Mars, walked up to us with a homemade badge reading police on his front. He had clearly been appointed by Almafia some time in the recent past, in case we ever tried such a scheme. In the back of my mind, it worried me that Alfie Mia was clearly so many stages ahead of us. I tried to shake off that thought, however, and swallowed my nerves to talk to him, while the band played on and Auntie C continued to shout. Are you protesting? He asked. No, I said sarcastically, and unable to help myself. General Wobberloff looked like everyone I had hated on Earth, but was strangely absent from most of Mraz. Smug, entitled, in a position of authority for all the wrong reasons of pride and vanity, because he thought the power made him look bigger than the small being he was. I thought we'd do a spot of meditating while it was quiet. What are you protesting? The fact that we can't protest. But you're not allowed to protest. I know. That's why we're protesting. But you can't. We can. As you can see, we're protesting right now. But you're not allowed to. Well, if we were allowed to, we wouldn't have to protest now, would we? General Wobberloff didn't quite know what to say to that, and had clearly not been prepared for circumstances like this one that didn't fit into his two or three days of training, back when flashing his badge had been enough to stop people in their tracks. That didn't work on desperate people like us, though, and strangely our desperation had seemed to spread to him instead. Visibly panicked now that we hadn't been good little citizens and complied, he tried a different approach. Well, as long as it's a protest, not a strike. Oh, I said, will that make it easier for you? In that case, this is a strike as well. Strike, agreed Auntie C in a megaphone. But that's not allowed either. I know, that's why we're striking. Well, said a wag from the crowd. What are you striking from? I mean, Mauritian arts ever do anything. What did any of you ever do for us? See that road behind you, I pointed out. We built that. And that hat you're wearing was knitted by my Clandersprod friend here. That technology you're using to holographically film us to upload to the Universal later, that's McGrumpf technology. 
Your shoes seem to be made by glad to hard it manufacturers. The food you're carrying with you comes from Dewsbury Technology. And the translator circuits you're using to listen to me now, that's Mechion. The only reason any of you made it past, say, 300 in age, is down to Mechion Technology too. The weather control on this planet that helps keep climate change at bay, that's from the Bella Brats. If any of you have ever used a lawyer, they probably came from Camelosia. And you with that MP90 in your hand. I'm willing to bet that there's a lot of Earth music on there. The bad attitude and ignorance, though. That's all yours now, my fears. See that row behind you? I pointed out. We built that. And that hat you're wearing was knitted by my Clandersprod friend here. That technology you're using to holographically film us to upload to the Universal later? That's my Grumpf technology. Your shoes seem to be made by glad to hard it manufacturers. The food you're carrying with you comes from Dewsbury Technology. And the translator circuits you're using to listen to me now? That's Mechion. The only reason any of you made it past, say, 300 in age, is down to Mechion Technology too. The weather control on this planet that helps keep climate change at bay? That's from the Bella Brats. If any of you have ever used a lawyer, they probably came from Camelosia. And you with that MP90 in your hand. I'm willing to bet that there's a lot of Earth music on there. The bad attitude and ignorance, though. That's all yours now, my fears. Now listen here, Missy. Butted in the general again. You have no right to do this. I know. That's why we're protesting. Because by now all our rights have been taken from us, including this one. So we have nothing to lose. We're desperate. We want the crowd to see that we're desperate. I'm a general, I am. I have authority over you. See all the medals? I didn't get them for fun, you know. Oh yes, you did, shouted Oberon. You made them yourself from little bits of worthless plastic. I know you. You're younger than me, and in our entire lifetime, Raz has had precisely no wars and only ever seen two skirmishes, one of which I got hurt in, and I don't remember seeing you there protecting me. The general turned many magnificent shades of roulette. See here, I can arrest the lot of you. I have the authority to. You see, I said to the passing crowd, this is what they do when they know they can't answer our queries. They take away our rights to stop us speaking out. So if you feel, like we do, that we've taken a wrong turning in politics and there's nothing you can do to stop it, there is. Speak out with us. Free our glab to hard it, friend. Give us back our democratic elections. Down with our Mathia. To my surprise, most of the crowd responded to us well, while the general seemed to have something of a breakdown. How many Marasian arts, I wondered, had really been agreeing with us in silence all this time, despite the apparent absence of anyone speaking out on the universal and in the street? By now the general had been joined by a second figure, Cassiope Ferret, who looked even more hopeless as he hopped from one foot to another, telling us that what we were doing was illegal and to stop it now. When the law is wrong and those who make the laws unfit for purpose and in it for their own ends, every good thing is illegal, said Oberon simply. We're a little reminder to make you put the law right again, with thousands of witnesses to what you do next. Cassiope Ferret didn't like that, and was clearly calling Alma Fear for backup. But what backup could be possibly turned to? The town hall thugs, as it happened, who arrived a few minutes later looking dense with rage. They pushed their way to the front and tried to stir up yet more division, but by now we have the measure of them. Our humans just oversensitive, like all humans. Everything's fine, on Mars, shouted one protester. Clearly it isn't, or I wouldn't be risking my life protesting, I said, and I'd far rather be sensitive and oblivious. Who asked you to come here? asked another Marasian art. Your government, I said simply. Your previous government. They were interested in having off-worlders here once upon a time. They thought it would help with Mars' spiritual and economic growth in the days before Almathea made us his fall boys and girls. Or are you too thick to remember? Well, we don't want you here, spat another member of the crowd. I laughed. I don't particularly want you here either, but we're stuck with each other, so let me make the best of it, eh? Look at her, said one. Clearly pregnant and with one of our own too. half breed shouldn't be allowed. I held Oberon's wing. This baby will be born from love, from two people who love each other and want to be with each other and bring their baby up on a planet they love too. Tell me, in what way does that make us inferior to you? There's no love coming from your side of the planet, I can tell you. But it will look funny declared one thug, who had clearly been through some wars of his own. Not as funny as you, fish face, I spat back, enjoying the fact that this Marasian art wasn't sure how, or if I'd insulted him with this earth slang. At least my baby will be unique. 
You lot just look the same with your pretend toughness and your desperate need to keep up with your peers. Purity on Mars, chanted another. This time Oberon butted in. Do your history homework. We aren't as pure as you might think. I'm willing to bet there's Camelosi and green blood in you somewhere from all their invasions millennia ago. And do you remember the times millions of years ago when Mars was a planet in two that never used to mix? We got over that, no problem, with DNA from both sides of the planet. We are all hybrid. The difference is you lot are so thick, some of you must have come from Argybraths. A third voice joined in tauntingly. Why don't you just go home if you don't like this planet so much you have to protest about it? I stopped in my tracks at this. But don't you see, I do love this planet, which is why I'm protesting, to protect what I think is wonderful about it. I adore this planet. I love the brightness of its sun and the way it shines on me even when I'm not directly in it. I love the weirdness of its lakes that no one can drink or bathe in, yet everyone considers a feature point. I love the way the sun's rays glint off the crystals that make up all the roads and statues. I love the way Mars feels cosily like home and endlessly, fascinatingly, wondrously different to anything anywhere else in the universe. I love the universal, now I've got used to it, and the way I can learn anything about anything just by thinking about it, without even the touch of a button. Most of all, though, I love the people, how deep and kind and wise and helpful and warm most of you are once I get to know you. I love the depth of this planet compared to the superficiality of home and the feeling that everyone cares about everything here. I love the peace and serenity and tranquility so different to my old life. I love the way this world is run for the most part. So care for us now and what's happening to us, because you might be next. This is my home. I felt it the minute I came here and I still feel it now, even after everything that's happened. The only thing I don't love is the part where people are out to kill me and lock my friends up for something they didn't do. And tell me which of you would love that. And if I don't speak out about it, if the people who suffer through unjust laws don't make a stand over it, how will the people who aren't affected by these laws ever know about them? Oberon slapped me on the back at this. I was half afraid this would too. The thugs seemingly had no more ammunition left and their leaders were left stranded, unable to do any more muttering something feeble about getting us when we stopped. But we didn't stop. We had too much to say that had been building up inside of us for so long but was exploding out of us now. Especially Auntie C, who, wielding the megaphone, filled the Eurasian arts in on our history, our lives, our band, our shameless government and what they were doing to us. Who needed the universal when you had a clandestrod with a megaphone? So we went back to playing our music and occasionally rallying the crowd to our cause. We got requests for all sorts of Mauritian art songs I'd never even heard of, us off-worlders trying to gamely keep up as we improvised our way around the basic melodies. I was worried it might be turning into a formless noise, but an audience who had never come across jazz before seemed to be really getting into it as the sounds of eight different planets bounced off each other and out to the sky, crisscrossing most beautifully and occasionally hitting the same notes. By now Auntie Sia got herself worked up about poor Jeremy being held captive after doing nothing wrong and the crowd had grown in numbers to the point where they were chanting Free the clap to Harlan! Free the clap to Harlan! We should be glad to have him here! Free the clap to Harlan! Free the clap to Harlan! We should be glad to have him here! Over and over. So with the band at the head of the crowd, we marched on the government's headquarters and chanted while the public rattled on the doors, shook their fists and yelled along with us. The noise of the people's frustrations grew and grew and grew until it couldn't be ignored any longer. As beautiful as our music sometimes was, this was truly the sound of my dreams. Maybe a thousand people all working with each other to the same design, that of peace, of putting wrongs right, of making this planet the best it could be for all of us. It felt like the moment of our greatest triumph. Free and it wasn't even a bell brat. But our adversary was slippery and as good with words in his own way as we were. Before long, Almafir himself was in the doorway, trying to quell the crowd with his usual look of smug disdain. For the moment, it wasn't a match for a clandestrod and a megaphone and a hostile crowd, and they quickly surged past him, pushing him back. This is the first time I had seen him in person, and my first shock was that he was smaller than I had always imagined, more vulnerable and fragile than the all-conquering figure bulletins made him out to be. Somehow, more, for lack of a better word, human. 
For a moment our eyes locked, and even with my lowly telepathic skills, I felt a sensation of pure distaste crossed over his mind as he stared me down. This is a government building, he squeaked while Oberon shot back. Yes, one you shouldn't be in anymore. The people have unelected you. Plus we are the ones who get to say who's in government, and it's about time we saw what you were doing with it. Down with these walls. Transparency rules. But this is anarchy, squeaked Armathea. Anarchy is what you get in response to a dictatorship, yelled Oberon. A sea of Marasian arts rushed forward, carrying us with it. Given that due to his own private research, Oberon vaguely knew the layout and where to steer it, we soon found ourselves by the makeshift prison cells, which hadn't been used in centuries. We found Jeremy, looking a little worse for wear and confused over all the commotion, pushing himself as far back in his cell as he possibly could, his heart clearly pounding and looking as if he hadn't slept. He gave us a squeak of recognition as he saw us, and we waved a hand or a wing at him. Almathir agreed to release him now, in front of us, with all charges dropped if the crowd went home. Figuring it was our best bargain for now, whilst warning that we would be back again if he tried anything else like deporting us, we accepted. The cell door was opened, and Jeremy was handed to s- and lifted above the crowd's head and passed back outside, while crowd chants of, We fear, Alma fear, followed. Auntie C's latest creation over the megaphone. Eventually the chants died down as the crowd waited for what would happen next. It was Oberon who spoke up. And we go back to having fair elections every month, that everyone can stand in and everybody can vote in? A smug look came over Armathir's face as he seemed to regain some of his old composure and he slurred. We'll see. No, I added, a new election guaranteed or we all stay here and nobody goes home and nobody gets elected or re-elected, least of all you. Almathea stood before us, his wings folded, his eyes bearing down deep into my soul. Friends, I will give you what you want eventually, of course, for I am always on your side. But it is not that simple. Laws have been put into motion, timetables have been created, the course of law doesn't stop on a whim. We can't have our elections stolen by emboldened outlaws, which is all these species are. Stop the steal! Don't listen to him, I hissed. See through his lies. Despite some of us looking different to you, we have far more in common with you than he does. He's taking all our money and siphoning it off to the Intergalactic Peace Federation to stay in power. Almathea glared. More unsubstantiated rumours. We know from the pollsters that we would have won this election anyway if we'd chosen to run it. Then why not just run it, you blackguard? Oberon hissed. But running it would have caused unnecessary and undue alarm of the population, allowing a level of distrust and instability to creep in. Our economy is only just starting to do well again. We don't want to lose that, do we? Because some off-worlders are trying to overthrow the government from the inside for their own evil ends, aiding and abetting their own countries. What do they really care about what happens here on this planet? They can meddle here all they like and then just fly away home and nobody can stop them. We're not, I murmur, but the crowd aren't listening the way they were. We've created the biggest economic growth Mars has ever seen. We're in the process of restoring our grand military. We're getting you the biggest tax cuts in history, right? And please, somebody shut up that kind of sprout, said Almathea, clearly back at his stride now. I could barely hear myself talk to think this used to be such a peaceful planet before these interlopers came along. We felt deflated suddenly, and not quite sure why. Oberon tried again, appealing to the crowd. None of that's true. We'll only the military part, and that's where your taxes are going. That and the flags and the cakes to lobby the Bella Brats with. They're so corrupt. He turned to Armathea directly. Can you explain where our money goes? And why you have off-worlders digging ditches for you? Why no one else can stand for office except your party? And why we've been silenced? Armathea grinned an evil politician's grin I knew from Earth. The sort they make when they know they're lying, but no one will ever possibly find out about it. It goes to pay our debts, and against other planets trying to force us into economic ruin. Somebody needs to build our ditches, and the moment your friends are currently unemployed, which just isn't acceptable in this economic climate. We have decided to stand again for the foreseeable future in the name of stability, so we can really get our trade deals going with other planets without a new government taking over halfway through as before. That was just messy and interrupted things. I also have to warn you, and Almathea dropped his voice down to a low chill factor of a hundred. Everything that you do here, all of you, any of you, is being recorded on the Universal and could be placed on your permanent records. So no damage or revolutions here, please. You'll make a mess of my lovely new carpet. 
Let's see, any of you try and get any employment to grow your houses then. And what was the last one you said about being silenced? Oh, yes. I'm not the one with the megaphone. We only need it because you took our voice away from us, I cry. And if your deal was that good, you'd be able to put it to the people with a vote. Plus, we paid for that carpet. How dare you use our funds to pay for your own ends? But somehow nobody was listening anymore. Far from storming the room, they waved the weather a few minutes ago. Now everybody was simply milling around, looking confused. You show of gratitude for bringing this to my attention, said Alma Fear. I will not be pressing charges against any of you. And in a show of goodwill, I will even restore some of the off-worlders' rights back to them, on the condition that they go away and leave complicated policies to the people elected to do it. Oh, and as our ditches are dug, I think the off-worlders can go home and go back to eating, or sleeping, or jabbering about reality TV shows, or knitting, or whatever it is these aliens do for fun, while the rest of us are working hard. The crowd slumped off dejectedly. Remember this, cried Oberon. If Alma Fear tries to take away any of our rights again, we will protest once more and prove to you that he never keeps his word. But the crowd were only half listening, clearly rattled by Alma Fear's talk of union the universal to spy on them. In that moment, we'd lost them. Well, said Oberon that night, after we'd trudged home, that could have gone better, but it could have gone worse, I suppose. At least we have Jeremy back with us, I add, having made sure he was staying the night with us safe. And some concessions. I wonder if he'll keep them. Do you know I think he might? At least for now. I doubt there'll be any more talk of deportation for the time being. I think Alma Thea knows how close he came to being overthrown today. He won't dare risk anything that makes us look as if we're right. It's a real shame we couldn't get him to agree to another election, though. I'm convinced he'd lose whatever manipulation he tried to use. Even if Aliath and I hadn't been allowed to stand against him, I'm sure he'd lose against someone. And anyone has to be better than him. People are fed up with his policies now and don't trust him an inch. He's just good at talking his way out of trouble and throwing the blame back on us. He's not the first politician that's been true for, I agree. We so nearly had him. I half wondered about shouting riot and getting the crowd to smash up the town hall. I didn't think that would have worked out in the end. No, said Oberon, that would have made us look like them. We need to keep control somehow and outsmart them. I contemplate this. At least we got the band out of hibernation and Jeremy is safe. I'm afraid I won't dare try anything with him again any time soon. The clapter had it squeaked in agreement from under my shirt where he had been hiding in lieu of our table. We can probably meet up again safely now too. The footage of what happened will be all over the universal for those who weren't there and some of them will see through it. It's made them, some of them think at least. All they need is one more push and then there will be a riot. Even Elma Fear couldn't stop. At least we tried, said Oberon, putting his wings around me. You did ever so well and I know how much anxiety you went through to do that. All those people yelling at you after trying to keep a low profile for so long. I know that would have been the worst thing for your anxiety, but somehow you did it. I'm so proud of you. I beam at this. You too, Oberon, I agreed. I couldn't have done it without you. We make such a great team, don't we? And at least it looks as if our baby will be born on Mars now. I was worried you would be put on a space shuttle and I never see either of you again. So I guess it's a sort of win. And you, Jeremy, you're really all right. My shirt squeaked and I patted what I hoped was his nose. We won't let them hurt you, Jeremy, I said. Ever again. You were so very brave. You're the bravest being I've ever met, seconded Oberon. He put the rest of us to shame. A furry paw came out from under my shirt and held hands and wings of both of us as we stood there in solidarity. Somehow, though, our conversation only sort of helped. We hadn't been able to do anything about the real problems facing the planet as a whole. There was still corruption going on, still racism and speciesism at the heart of the government, and still absolutely no chance of an election to get rid of it. Weeks went by, with not very much happening. We were all safe, and the bulletins were all quiet. While Mra seems to have fading memories of our mini-revolt, it clearly hadn't forgotten it altogether. And there was a true feeling in the air of revolution, one we weren't sure whether to risk setting off exploding again, or to leave on Scylla. 
Eventually, though, we thought it best to stand back. Our universal rights restored, we looked on impressed and rather proud as Malaysian arts began to ask awkward questions about funding and corruption. There was an investigation, though given that it was being conducted by the same government who had broken the law in the first place, we didn't hold up a lot of hope for the outcome. Still, we were in a better place than we were before. A sheepish-looking Bertie even appeared on the BCBC, explaining his conduct in his visit to Mraz, admitting that he had been made an honorary peer on our planet. You mean, they filled him with water and told him to take a running jump? I always thought he was a bit wet, said Oberon, before I had time to explain that this was a different type of peer, and denying that he even liked cakes. But I do have a fondness for pastries if anyone would like to send me any. Amethia had to explain that, yes, he was normal, and he loved off-world music, really, just not when it was being barked at him through a megaphone by a deranged clandestrad. He even agreed when questions were put to him that, yes, all off-worlders were indeed citizens who shared equal rights to local-born Malaysian arts. He didn't know why that was even a question to be asked. Honest. A teller who wanted to make a name for themselves read his fortune live on air on the Universal and said that they saw, saw great scandal and disgrace. Shortly followed by another, clearly fake, who saw only a growth of popularity and economic success. Jeremy was still quite understandably scared for some time afterwards, and one or other of us thirteen stayed with him every night for weeks until he felt safe to go out on his own again, coaxing him with tales of his rescue that he barely remembered. He had become quite a star in Glabdahardis, as no Glabdahardis had ever done something as dangerous enough to be imprisoned for or rescued before. Instead, we'd all run away or hid under a table at the first sign of trouble. As for Auntie C, we had donated her the megaphone, but after realising how much she still enjoyed it, using it for fun when we were trying to sleep, had sneaked the batteries out of the back when she wasn't looking, and joined in with her complaints of poor earth workmanship being unlike lifelong clandestine technology, and then placated her with some earthly Earl Grey tea from our next Voldivian shipment as a peace offering. Time hung heavy on us all as we waited for what came next. But for now, for the next few weeks, things seem to have gone back largely to normal. We were deep in our daily Malaysian meditation session when the next life-altering event happened. Oberon was telling me off jokingly that I couldn't possibly keep my mind still if my body was fidgeting all over the place when he suddenly looked concerned. You're leaking, he said, from a different place in your eyes this time. Is that another human thing? Leaping up, I realised what it was. Yes, it's an earth thing, that earth thing, but it's arrived early. I should have another two months yet. For an earth baby, maybe, said Oberon thoughtfully, but for a Eurasian art baby, you're late. I guess you're straight down the middle between the two. Now, don't worry, I've read everything I can about the accoutrement procedures and... Oh, I don't remember reading about that. Your blood, it's red, not blue, and it's outside your body. I somehow forgot to ask you about that. With that, Oberon slumped to the floor. Apparently the shock of his first sight of human blood was too much for him. Wonderful. Our plans out the window, I somehow managed to get Auntie C on the Universal. Thanking my stars that the Universal had been restored, who rushed round immediately, the earth curlers I had sent her for a birthday that week still in her hair. No, my dear, don't worry about a thing. I've done a little bit more clunders for chicks in my clan than you've had hot dinners. Well, these may actually give you where the replicating machine keeps breaking down every few minutes. Not like clunders for technology at all. Now, what's over on doing on the floor? Never mind, we'll just put a rug over it. Barely an hour of labour later, thank goodness for shorter narration art times cancelling earth times out, and I was holding my newborn boy in my arms, while Auntie C was disconnecting an umbilical cord made of Velcro, another handy narration art genetic addition to giving birth. And there he was, new life, new life born from me and the being I loved more than anyone else in the universe. He was so very beautiful. Those big, thoughtful, Marasian eyes peeking out from such a delightful and emotional human face made my heart break. His stubby arms were matched on both sides by stubby wings, and he had the cutest, tiniest of tails sticking out of his bottom. 
already, as I did my best to coo and look after him. I felt him doing the same for me, telepathically scanning my mind and sending bonding thoughts back to me as he recognised my voice. Hello, Eleron, I said, holding his tiny wings in my hands as his antennae fluttered into life and his legs kicked. Welcome to the universe. It's a big universe out there, and it's all yours to explore. And I whispered into his ear, suddenly stupidly afraid that Auntie C might hear me and laugh at me. You are so loved. Auntie C leaned over. Hello, little one. He has his father's eyes and his mother's face. Oh, and his strong parents' curlers. Hey, give that back. No, no, don't chew it. That's quite a strong grip he has there. That's some real human teeth I see. I grin. Good, because I have a strong grip too, and I might just never let him out of my arms. Well, well you are for now, whistled Auntie C. The, the first thing Clark is to do with their babies is put them on the windowsill of the cave for extra sunlight. And even though he isn't a clandestine, of a sun here is three times dimmer, it won't do him any harm. Holding him by the window should do for now, though, if you don't want to let him go. That was how Oberon found us, with our backs to him, and making off cooing noises as he came round. Oh, he said, bewildered, you sound excited. Is the post arriving or something? It's been, I grinned, turning round. Say hello to Eleron. Oh, said Oberon through hazy and registering eyes. Hi, Eleron. Nice of a post Marasian art to deliver babies now. I hope they get extra wages for it. Babies are heavy. With that, he slumped back to sleep while I held my bundle of joy in my arms and cried happy, grateful tears while Auntie C tidied up behind me. The baby I thought I would never have was actually here, and it was the single best thing that had ever happened to me. In a very Marasian art way, I felt as if fate had brought me to Mraz and to Oberon, just so I could be here at this moment, holding this particular child in my arms, the way all mine and his parents and grandparents and great-grandparents and great Marasian errands and everyone before us had been fated to meet up too, just so we could get to this moment. As I held Eleron in my arms, I felt the call of the centuries behind me, calling me and nodding to me, at the same time felt a long line of future human Marasian arts, stretching out into infinity, each offspring possible only because of who had been born right now, and what we had all gone through. I felt my past, and my present, and my future, all in perfect sync, and I had never felt so happy. This was a feeling I just had to share, I thought, just as Oberon woke again behind me. Did I miss anything? he said cheerfully to Auntie C. Not much, she said. Just a baby. Your baby. Oh, said Oberon. That's nice. Wait, 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 what? I have to hurry to get busy casting the time of birth, recording horoscopes, working out their future. Oh, and I suppose I'd better meet them first, hadn't I? Thankfully, Auntie C, still more acquainted to the ways of Mraz than me, had recorded Eleron's birth time without any fuss. And after Oberon had spent a precious hour nuzzling his new son alongside me, he quickly got to work casting his horoscope. His eyebrows widened in surprise at every astrological reading I took. Is it good? Is he going to grow up to make us proud? And more importantly, is he going to be safe and happy? I'll say, said Oberon, look at these readings. He's going to be very important indeed to the whole universe, and he must be safe to live long enough to do it. What in? I asked. I'm not sure yet, but he's going to be some kind of leader, some kind of peace leader. I think he's going to save the universe from itself, or at least that's what it says here. These conjunctions haven't been seen like this for multiple generations. I couldn't have made his astrological readings any better if I could have chosen them myself. Oh, that's nice, I said, not quite grasping the significance of Marasian predictions. Our oh, little boy... I couldn't be more proud of him, said Oberon, beaming, as if Eleron had achieved all this already. Or you, he smiled at me, hugging me. Even though we had tried to keep things quiet, my pregnancy had been quite hard to hide, and it soon became common knowledge that I'd had a humoration art. At first I was scared of what the world might do to me and my baby, but as time wore on it became clear that most humoration arts were kind. 
Well-wishers would leave cards and packages and parcels outside our door, many times apologising for what Alma Thea had done to us, and often containing the most unsuitable of things to my human eyes that Oberon told me would have been perfect for a Mauritian art baby. The Infant's Guide to Mortality, Philosophy and Our Place in the Universe books, for instance, were gratefully received, but stored in the attic, alongside the Junior Aura Painting Toolkit and the Rules of the Universe guidebook in Baby Speak. Not that I was ungrateful, and I knew I was on a planet where these things were normal, but I wanted my child to have the sort of childhood they would have had on Earth, or as close as I could give them, until we found out for sure if they were more Mauritian art or human. I compromised with Oberon, though, ruling out what he considered alien and strange Earth affairs, like rusks and dummies. We were grateful, too, for the special clandestrod nappies that changed themselves. Our friends of the intergalactic players were ecstatic about our new baby. Many new Mauritian art instruments ended up being wrapped in shiny parcels and delivered to our door by our Mauritian art friends, while Auntie C knitted us beautiful woolen shawls and blankets. Mariana provided us with a Mechion activity centre, which made giant chemical explosions at the touch of a button, which I confiscated after Eleron came close to singeing his eyebrows off. And Brenda built us the most remarkable wooden cot, built, it had to be said, like no other cot I had ever seen, but, well, she did offer, and had told us several times that she knew how to build it better than any human. Jeremy was particularly taken with our new delivery, and provided us with a most amazingly lifelike Labdahardic worry doll, a gift he told us would help keep the Ewok ninjas in Eleron's closet at bay, but soon became Eleron's favourite toy. Eleron had more babysitters than probably any baby had ever had on Mars before, and we had no end of friends asking us if we were planning to go out anywhere at all, just so they could take charge of him. Eleron seemed particularly fond of Jeremy, perhaps because they were nearly the same size, but Jeremy was too anxious to babysit on his own, and often came in pairs with the others. Auntie C too really took up her mantle as Sprog parent, playing great long complicated clandestrog games with Eleron I couldn't begin to understand, but he clearly could. It was, I hoped, a happy childhood, and our baby surprised Oberon by laughing a lot, more than any Mauritian art baby ever had, even if he still had a faraway look in his eyes that meant he never quite looked human either. It was, at least, as happy and safe a start in life as we could ever have hoped to have given Eleron, who had 13 parental figures to choose from, even if 11 of them got to hand the baby back over and go home, while Oberon and I sat up and worried late into the night. The problem we had was that we had nothing and no one to compare Eleron to, but having never been a Humerasian art before, we just had to hope for the best and enjoy as much of his childhood as we could. It became clear early on that Eleron was nothing like human babies. He didn't cry and made his feelings and needs known with a murmuring of telepathy I could hear if I concentrated and if I wasn't paying enough attention to that then a gentle, subtle raise of his wings would see me coming. Occasionally, when I didn't notice this either, he would cough as if trying to get my attention. At times it felt like being the parent of a commercially Mauritian grandparent who was always requesting my help than a little child. Somehow I felt less needed than I had assumed I would be, as Eleron became independent quickly, yet simultaneously deeply proud of our offspring, who was already proving himself to be so kind and caring, he would wait for our needs to be seen to first before calling out to us. Eleron wasn't much trouble, not as restless and noisy as I had been, according to my earthly parents, or as endlessly curious and insatiable as Oberon had been, according to his. When he wasn't having fun with one or other of his babysitters, or us, Eleron seemed to spend most of his time staring thoughtfully up at the world with big eyes, yet always seemed to be absent too, as if listening in to some distant radio broadcast. I'd assumed at first that this was just a Mauritian art thing, but speaking to Oberon I found out that this was not really like Mauritian art babies either, and he'd long assumed it was a human thing. Oberon, used to a certain level of telepathy between Mauritian arts, tried to reach Eleron's thoughts, but couldn't make strong telepathic connection with him and said he always seemed to be talking in his head to someone, but what we heard out loud were gurgling sounds. Oberon was as confused as me in many ways, as Eleron didn't fit everything he knew of Mauritian art babies either. There were no accidental manifestation of imaginary entities the way there often were in the early years for Mauritian arts, nor did Eleron think himself to sleep the way he had, and often stayed up for hours, staring. 
Elrond wasn't particularly interested in learning either, the way his dad had hoped. If there was an intelligence fair, it would have been thought unusual had he been on Earth. Even so, he was clearly deep, far deeper than an average Earth baby, with a permanent frown as if trying to understand something that was just out of his reach. I'd often sensed that my offspring was far more aware than a baby his age should be, and often seemed to be understanding what I wanted him to do without even having to say. I tried one day to ask him what he was listening to, but he just frowned with his curious mixture of Mauritian art antennae and human eyebrows, as if puzzled that I'd had to ask, and surely I could hear it too. Eventually his parents came to accept that Eleron was a halfway baby, not really like either of us, with quirks all of his own. We loved him dearly, cherishing each precious moment with him, getting hugely excited at every fresh development he made, be it human-esque or Mauritian art-like, and proudly showing him off to all our friends, with Auntie C fussing round him the way only a sprog parent can. Elrin was, if nothing else, loved with all our hearts, and in turn filled ours more than we ever dreamed possible. Still, though, with so much uncertainty on Mars, I wonder constantly what our young Humorasian would grow up to be, what sort of life we might get to live, and where, and realised with that, despite the uncertainty of bringing up the world's first Humorasian, in this thought at least, I was at one with all new mothers everywhere in the universe. Time passed remorselessly quickly, as Eleron grew up seemingly by the hour, Oberon and I already mourning his early childhood, even if we still had so much of it to come and celebrate. Thank goodness we sat so much on the universal safely recorded to look at in old age, in case we missed anything. It was such a useful device. Our desire to keep a low profile went out the window as we bombarded it with diary entries of the fun things Eleron had done, and pictures of him doing them. Eleron was up and talking much quicker than a human baby, if a little slow for a Mauritian art one, and I soon realised that all my old expectations of being a mother back on Earth had all gone out the window. Oberon was especially proud when he picked up his behoosily and managed to coax two or three notes out of it before handing it back. The boys are natural, he said, beaming. Soon I might be handing over my place as conductor of the Intergalactic Peace Band. He also developed Auntie C's love of tea, much to her sheer joy. My dears, she said one day while visiting, something she found as many excuses to do as she could. He's even drinking out of a teapot spout like a sprog parent. And to think you two tell me that's not natural. Even Jeremy would come out of his house and meet us, entertaining Eleron with conjuring tricks and pretty glab to hard nursery rhymes. Ones for the far less grisly than earth ones, joked Oberon one day. Winds blowing down cradles, mice having their tails cut off, wolves eating grandmas, dead blackbirds in a pie. No wonder you all grow up so weird. Eleron became particularly fond of S. He would play long games of hide and seek with him, games that Eleron invariably won, given that it's filled up most of our house. Eleron liked it too when a visitor called round and our house suddenly got bigger. Somehow all the things I'd experienced on Mars that seemed so alien and strange when I first arrived here became normal for the first time as I saw them through Eleron's eyes. It was like a ginormous reset button too. In one go I had stopped being afraid of the outside world, afraid of Alma Thea, afraid of being in the wrong place, afraid that I would never fit in, of the past coming back to haunt me. Instead I knew now, with some deep down conviction, that I was meant to be here to be mother to this wonderful assortment of contradictions, to be girlfriend of his wonderful Mauritian art, to be a citizen of his beautiful planet. Everything that had happened before suddenly seemed like a bad dream, one I didn't have to worry about any more, as at last my life made sense. Suddenly, from Eleron being born, so was I. One day I was thinking these things through again, and how much things had changed for the better, when Eleron suddenly giggled with such alacrity that I nearly dropped his meal from the food dispensary. After a lot of trial and error, we found he most liked to eat human and Mauritian food jumbled up together. Hard as I tried, I couldn't see what he had been laughing at. Puzzled, for I had noticed this trait before out of the corner of my eye, but never so close up, I asked him what had made him giggle. Nasha, he said simply. Oh, cute, I thought. He's got an imaginary friend, something refreshing the earth like at last. Settling down in my favourite armchair, I thought it only polite to ask first to make sure I wasn't sitting on She's not here, silly mummy, said Eleron, his twinkling blue eyes meeting mine. 
Martha is a million miles away. She's still the nearest fellow, I think. Or at least her voice is more intelligible than the rest. How many voices can you hear? I asked, intrigued. If I properly concentrate, about 15. Ten of those are really far away, though, so I have to think really hard. I thought out loud to myself, still not quite sure whether to take this new information at face value or not. Well, the nearest planet to here would be McGrumph, and after that, Earth. Martha sounds like an Earth name to me. Can you see what she looks like? Is she built like me? Eleron shook his head. Is she like Daddy? No, not much. Auntie Clandis Rod. Eleron laughed at her glorious <laughs> laugh again. She says no, and I think she's a little bit insulted. OK, then, I said, having exhausted my supply of races for Eleron might have seen, reaching for Oberon's dusty second-hand bargain illustrated copy of Endurance. Which of these species does she remind you of most? Eleron thumbed through the pages with intense concentration on his face, but by the end of the book was shaking his head. None of those, he said. The closest I can think of is me, but that isn't quite right either. Can you ask Martha? She says she's a humour grump. I don't remember seeing one of those in the book. A humour grump, I said, laughing. Don't be silly, darling, there isn't such a thing. Well, there wasn't till recently, but there is now, said Eleron matter-of-factly, and he went back to talking in his head. Oberon too had noticed this new behaviour and asked me about it. That's just another weird earth thing, right? Like the time he blew bubbles and I rang the doctor, or the time he burped and I thought he'd been possessed by some evil invisible species. No, I said, at least not like that. If it was an earth thing, they would be totally imaginary, and here, but invisible, and getting up to all sorts of mischief that Oberon wouldn't be allowed to do himself. Ha, <laughs> very human, giggled Oberon teasingly, putting the blame on someone else. I walloped him good-naturedly. But that's not what's happening here, I continued. He isn't just talking to these people, he's interacting with them, listening to what they have to say, and responding to it. Maybe it's just another combination thing, Oberon asked. A combination of Mauritian art telepathy, with real Mauritian arts combined with an earthly imagination and desire for company. Maybe, I said unconvincingly. Some of the things he comes out with, though. He wouldn't have learnt it from us, or Auntie C, or any of the others. So where did it come from? Well, said Oberon, we know he's an intelligent child. He's probably the first child in the universe to know so many different species in one go. Maybe he's just building on what he knows and trying to make sense of them in his own way. But in my heart of hearts, I knew he wasn't. After all, the humming sound we had heard during the pregnancy had grown louder since he'd been born and was growing by the day. When we asked Eleron about it, he just shrugged his wings in a very human way and said that as it was the first ever humoration art, he thought he was probably meant to sound like that. You worry too much, he said to me when I asked, a favourite catchphrase of his. And you think too much, he said to his father. But me, I'm just right. He has the measure of us all right, grinned Oberon. And he seems to be picking ideas up from being babysat by Brenda. I think between the balance of the two of us and all the other species babysitting him, he really is going to be just fine. I so love those days with Oberon and Eleron. I craved so long to have a normal family life, and even though they didn't look the way I'd imagined my family when I was young, that didn't matter one bit. Oberon was very proud, showing Eleron off on the Universal for his parents and Grand Marasian errant to see. He looks just like you, son, said Oberon's dad. No, he's a, not a redhead, and I can't see any flame, said his Grand Marasian errant. He doesn't look a thing like the sun. My parents were a harder sell. They were pleased to hear from me at first, and when I told them they were grandparents, but when I mentioned the baby was a hybrid one, they lost all interest and changed the subject, something that hurt me terribly. It's fair loss, said Oberon comfortingly. They won't get to see him grow up, and I wouldn't have missed that for the world. One thing that surprised me was how much I learnt from Eleron. There I was, all set to teach him the ways of the world, the ways of my world, and what I knew of the one he was in now but I soon discovered that I was learning as much from him as he took from me. Eleron had his father's patience and tolerance, would always know telepathically when to cheer me up or look after me, and shared his same open-minded views, always trying to see things from all sides, and therefore understand people better without getting emotional about it. In turn, he understood my emotions better than even Oberon did, the human tendency to ebb and flow, or get anxiety or doubts out of nowhere, 
and was superbly comforting, understanding my problems but helping me see past them in the same way his father did. At times when Oberon had his head in the clouds, Eleron would keep me company back on the planet, and when I was busy he was content to sit for hours near silently sharing Oberon's deep views or listening to his debates. Watching Eleron, I actually learned how to react to Oberon better, in a gentler, less human way. Well, in turn, I think Oberon understood me better thanks to Eleron too. We belonged together, us three. Between us, we quickly became an unbreakable team, with Eleron the missing link who joined our two planets and their very different cultures, neither more like one of us or the other, but split right down the middle between the two of us. Mostly, though, he taught us compassion, and, no doubt due to his unique upbringing, he showed more empathy and compassion and understanding of other races than even my big heart and Oberon's big head had allowed us to. We did lots together too. After all, Eleron had two full cultures to learn from, never mind what his babysitters passed on to him. I taught him everything I could about Earth history, emphasising the music and all the bits Eleron seemed to like best, about dinosaurs and llamas and trains and all the television I had been brought up with. Oberon, in turn, taught Eleron a very different slant on the Asian art culture, emphasising all the bits he seemed to like best, such as fortune-telling, tarot cards and the thoughts of Eurasian art philosophers throughout the ages. It is better to fly with a Wazula bird than eat an algebraph's eggs and expect to swim. Oh, I get that now, I said, or similar variations on a theme. Eleron also loved to play, and our favourite game was planets, whereby Eleron would pick a random star out of the sky, would try to guess what life forms might live on it, giving me instructions on what to draw, while Oberon looked at the true scientific facts on the universal and tried to give him suggestions. Never once did Eleron seem lonely or feel isolated, despite being the only one of his kind, which had been my big fear since before he was born. After all, there were thirteen babysitters of all shapes and sizes who adored him, and we never wanted to let him out of our sight or go anywhere without him as it was. We also had great fun making up silly songs, the three of us, alternating a line each. Eleron, Oberon, Eleanor. Together we feel secure. A triumvirate forevermore. Eurasian art, human, humoration. All tuned in to their favourite station and started to dance. It was a contagion. A human, Eurasian art, and candy spread. All walked out with their fishing rod. They didn't catch anything, so home they plod. Earth, Sycorus free, and Mars. Each wants what the other has, with a possible exception of earthly jars. Being on Mars is never boring. There's always a new alien calling, not to mention your mother's unearthly snoring. What compared to the did you make, I laughed. large, Mars had taken to my growing toddler as much as they had Eleron as a baby, and we were almost local celebrities of a sort. Lots of passing Eurasian arts would coo over Eleron when we were out and about. Some would talk about how wonderful it was to see new life on Mars. Others would praise our parenting skills, misunderstanding that we had anything really to do with it. Like most children, Eleron was really bringing up himself, with his parents struggling to keep up. Others still would, kindly but mistakenly, Welcome him to a planet he'd been born on, as if we'd just stopped off a shuttle where he had lived here all his life. We felt safe on Mars, a happy family that was just like every other happy family, even if we didn't happen to look like any other family there. Gradually, across time, I felt a feeling I had never experienced, even on Earth. It was a sense of belonging, of happiness, of peace. Slowly, though, almost without us noticing, the bad days began to return. It all felt as if someone had been talking about us behind our backs and spreading lies, which, of course, Almathea probably had been doing, and we started slowly to notice a few discrepancies with the Universal, which suggested that a few things were being kept or hidden from the thirteen of us. Once when we were out together, a Eurasian art walked past us and openly tutted and glared at us. It's not normal, one of them said, and under their breath, just look at it. But Eleron would stare right back, with kinder eyes than they'd ever have, and would ask why a stranger would say that to him, 
and we would say in a loud voice that some Eurasian arts were just plain rude and Eleron wasn't to be like them when he grew up. When Eleron was out with Oberon, another said to him, Go home, as he morphed through the door of our house. I am home, said Eleron matter-of-factly. I've never known another. Would you like to see? It's probably just like yours. Like all Eurasian arts, Eleron was homeschooled using the universal and didn't have a class to go to, but he was assigned one he could mentally talk to when he needed to. His classmates became puzzled sometimes by some of his responses, so I explained to his teacher that he was half human. That explains it, she said. But what we couldn't explain to Eleron was why this information seemed to change the way she reacted to him, ignoring his answers to the class or asking where he learnt the information when he got something right. His peers, interestingly, were very open and accepting and found Eleron's variation of earth humour quite funny. It was the adults who didn't know quite what to do with him and tried to pretend that he wasn't there, that he was a problem that wasn't theirs to solve. Eleron, though, was bright and hard-working and as curious for learning about new things as his father, while his human side gave him an angle to working out problems that even the brightest Moration arts in the class didn't have, something that only seemed to spook the teachers all the more. We tried to talk to Eleron about prejudice and speciesism, and it was one of the hardest things I ever had to do, explaining to him why some people didn't like him on sight, out of fear or ignorance, or would hurt him without meaning to, because they didn't know how to react, so he might always have to be careful, but that he had the same rights as they did, and shouldn't take their ignorance to heart. How he was unique in the world, and had no choice about how people responded to that, but his response to them would show them how he was better than they were, it gave me many sleepless nights wondering what his future might be, why I had chosen this life path for him, and why I was on Mars at all. But that was my human, doubting side talking. Thankfully, Eleron's philosophical Eurasian art side always showed itself at times like this, and he didn't worry, or at least not out loud to me. Well then, he would say in his grown-up half Eurasian art way, I have to learn to be brave and educated and accept me then, because I'm not going anywhere. Sadly, though, neither were people's prejudices, and over time they grew, exponentially, until we began to genuinely fear for our safety all over again. We began feeling less and less like going outside, and instead became cocooned inside our house, gradually losing more and more access to the universal. Amathir's daily messages became more and more confident, as if he knew something we didn't know, but without any specifics that we could protest or fight back against. After a period of time when things had seemed to calm down and we no longer feared the daily bulletins in quite the same way, they returned with a vengeance one night, and our worst fears were confirmed. Somehow it was worse than it had ever been before. Instead of hostility, now it was outright war. Dear citizens, a year of the most historical significance is drawing to an end, and I am here to tell you that as of tonight, we are at war. Due to certain hostile activities by other planets, including intense economic competition, we have signed a treaty with the Bella Brats to destroy any ships that make their way to the side of the universe. This is in full accordance with the Intergalactic Peace Federation, who have backed our call for war with the following planets, Camelosia, Sigurus Free, Earth, Flap the Hardis, Deucius, Habridas. Fear not, though, Mars. Ever since I was elected, I've been increasing the military budget exponentially. We now have a whole fleet of space shuttles with missiles that we have been keeping in storage in a ditch behind our beloved town hall. In time, our brave military will conquer these other planets and take their resources to help Mars become the economic powerhouse she once was. In the meantime, we ask for volunteers to come forward, to sign up as reserves for the military, and for extra hours at our factories developing ammunition. Until the war is over and we have been declared the victors, we will also impose a strict curfew. Communication with all outside planets, including posts and have risen listening to the BCBC, will be forbidden, and use of the universal should be monitored at all times. As should be off-worlders in our midst, what we are doing is illegal. Well, technically it isn't illegal, maybe I should say immoral. Anyway, they are not one of us, and shouldn't be treated as such. Not that I condone violence against anyone, but... Well, you know what to do if you come across anyone other. Let's not forget the way that human and her conspirators tried to take down our government illegally a few months ago. You all know what to do if you see them, or know where they live. I know you will all be behind me at this very great and potentially damaging period in our history. 
I urge you to report anyone you see acting suspiciously or unpatriotically, especially those who are not like us. We are the greatest planet in the universe, and now at last we are headed back in the right direction. I've never been more confident in our future. We don't need charity or the economic trade they grant us. We are just a planet taking back its democratic rights. We bow in gratitude to Providence, but we are civilization of such noble birth. King Elmer, fear out. Just as the bulletins ended, three ginormous rockets launched into the sky, shaking our poor house as we rushed to the windows to see. <laughs> there they were, big, ugly, huge, the un like cubes, surely loaned from Bellabrat technology, whose devices often look like that, temporarily blocking out the stars. Elrond was hiding under his bed, the way Jeremy had taught him, and I badly wanted to join him there, but Oberon caught me first and nuzzled my forehead. I was dreading this day. We're not safe, was all he said. We have to get out of here before something bad happens. All of us, the first shuttle out of here, we leave. We can't stop this on our own. But you heard what they said, I gaped. They'll shoot down any shuttle that comes anywhere near us. Oberon made a most admiration like sneer. It's all for show. Almathea said he had three missiles, and three have gone up into the sky already. I doubt he'll have any more, even with the money he's been saving behind everyone's backs. As for that so-called hard-trained military, ha! A bunch of thugs from a town hall waving flags. It's not something to scare the bountiful Camelosian Empire now, is it? Or Clandestrad technology, or Mechion technology. Never mind everyone else. Then why is he doing it? I splutter. To keep power, said Oberon thoughtfully. And because he's still scared, our revolt really rattled him, and he knows he's less popular than he was, even if he's still safe in power for now. All it would take is one genuinely bad economic downturn, and he'd be gone. To think, I said, that he had us digging those ditches behind the town hall to hide his missiles in. We thought we were digging the first layer of a road, or at any rate something that might actually be useful. How dare he? He's the wickedest Mauritian art that's ever lived, said Oberon. Did you notice there was an audio block on that bulletin so nobody could copy it and post it to the BCBC? He's probably re-recorded his own special version to send to them that makes everything seem much more reasonable and stopping us all from contact with outside planets. That's just so that they don't get to hear about it. I don't think Almathir has any intention of going to war. This is all for show and so he can fool his people that he's keeping us safe when really we should be kept safe from him. Even so, we need to run before those missiles are turned on us, or we get chopped by our fellow law-abiding citizens. So what do we do, Oberon? First we go and pull our child out from under the bed and tell him everything's going to be fine. And then we're going to work out a way so that it is all going to be fine. Somehow. We went to retrieve Eleron and tried to do just that. But it was a hard task with the amount of sound going on in the streets, the people marching up and down singing the Eurasian Art National Anthem and waving flags. Somehow Eleron was more scared of that than the missiles, and I can't say I blamed him. So many people, he chatted. I didn't know there were this many people in the universe. Well, there's a lot more people than that in the universe, said Oberon, not unkindly. We're really a very small planet, and there aren't that many of them, really. Just a few dozen. Not like the crowds we had with our singing and protests. They're just making a lot of noise. All the sensible ones are safely tucked up in bed. What are they all doing? Letting off steam, said Oberon as matter-of-factly as he could get away with. They felt cooped up on this planet for too long and need a bit of relief, so Almathir is giving it to them. They'll be back to normal before the end of the morning. As long as they stay out in the main part of town rather than here, we'll be fine. We tried to put Eleron to bed and read him one of Oberon's favourite Moresian art fairy tales, Silver Curls and his forebears all about a princess telepathically communicating with her ancestors. But we soon realised it wasn't going to work. We could barely hear ourselves above the noise of the crowd which was growing bigger by now. We certainly couldn't expect poor Eleron to sleep through it. So, being careful not to let him see too much of the outside world, we took him to our bedroom where we sang earth songs very loudly and danced the night away. But as hard as we tried to make things seem normal, that was an impossible task. Nothing was normal here anymore. Things went back to normal by the end of the morning. 
Indeed, the sound of chanting and singing grew louder all night. Drain the swamp, the voices cried. Off worlders, get off our world! Narration our hearing tended to be better than a human, so it was no surprise that Oberon was the first to hear from right outside our door. Rushing to the window, he spotted a group of narration arts standing and pointing at our house. Quick as a flash, he grabbed me and Eleron and hauled us upstairs. It was an uncharacteristically aggressive move, so I knew without asking that something even more serious was happening. It's happened. They're here. They've found us, he hissed at me, while Eleron looked dazed. Who, I asked hopelessly, struggling to take in what was happening. Eleron struggled for a human translation and eventually hissed, The mob! They must have been stirred up by that inflammatory bulletin, and now they've set off to get us. This is all happening much quicker than I thought. But how do we know where we live? There's chance of the swamp. It's, it's Auntie C, I'm scared for, not us. Your aura. You've been here so long. The house glows with two shades now. And Eleron's too, which is halfway between ours. I should have realised before that it would mark us out. But I thought we'd have more time to make plans. To escape. What do you mean, I stammered. Though deep down I knew perfectly well what was going on. It's the same thing that had been keeping me awake for more than a year now. Almost ever since I'd arrived on Mars, in fact. They want us dead, Eleanor. You for being an off-worlder. Me for abetting you. And supposedly betraying them. And Eleron for being our offspring. That... Pause to find the right human word again. Imbecile has turned us into the enemy in order that people start thinking of him as the enemy. We're the ones who are going to pay for his crimes. But we've lasted so long. You're Marasian art. Surely you're meant to see through this sort of thing. We've never had this sort of thing before. Greed and love of power are human and mechion traits, not Marasian ones. They just don't recognise it for what it is. I'm sure there must have been parallels on Earth of people being fooled by their leaders telling lies and making it out to be the truth and taking it out on an innocent party. Well, today, here and now, that innocent party is us. I don't think this is going to end well. And of course there had been, too many of them to count. So many of them, but of course a century ago it had nearly led to the Earth being wiped out by a rogue dead Mechion, trying to save the rest of the universe. Oberon continued. I only understand the concept after hearing you talk about your life on Earth. Well, imagine what would happen on a planet where nobody believed you could do that, and a leader who'd done his homework and realised he could do exactly that, and no one would think to stop him. I gulped. All this time I was hoping that the goodness and kindness of Mraz would rub off on me, but I forgot that it could happen the other way around too, that Mraz could be corrupted by the Earth. The crowd noise was really loud outside by now. Were the walls of his household up, I asked Oberon, pityingly. Yes, he said confidently, and under his breath, clearly hoping I wouldn't hear, muttered, I hope, for good measure. Oberon was desperate to go outside, to join in the singing and to meet new Eurasian arts, and didn't understand why we couldn't let him. But meeting strangers is good, he said, quoting an old Eurasian art philosophy, because if you don't meet, a stranger will always be a stranger. They can never be a friend. Yes, dear, I said, but we have to choose our friends wisely. Friends who carry pitchforks and chant outside our house aren't really friends. They're morons. I whispered to Oberon, are we safe here? We could stay here forever, just the three of us. No need to go outside. And tell the peace band to do the same somehow. Oberon looked thoughtful. Not forever. For a long time we could, but... There is a way of breaking through the force field that holds Marasian houses together if enough people and the right tools are used. And how easy are these tools to get, I asked. Not very, said Oberon. I've only ever heard them used when breaking into buildings that no longer belong to anyone, when evidence is needed in some crime or other. But it is possible. It would have to be on the security force to have access to them, mind. And the groaned. If Alma Fear is behind all this, then I guess technically is the head of the security force. I can do what he wants. What can we possibly do? I'll try the others. Oberon tried hard to contact anyone he could to check they were safe, but to his horror he found the bulletins were true, and they'd revoked his universal privileges. We're on our own men, he said helplessly. In retrospect, I realised that this was the only time I'd ever seen him scared in all my time with him. We hugged each other tight, us three, listening to the sound of the crowd get louder and louder, pressing our foreheads together in one last desperate act of unity. 
It really did sound as if the crowd had the right tools to break into our lovely house, a symbol of what had made me feel so safe and protected on Mars, now buckling under the weight of every loud crack against our walls. We stayed there, panicked, cocooned out of our fear. If only we could get away, we would have a chance, said Oberon, as slim as it might be. But here we are sitting algebraphs, and I feared they did all of us. Is this the end? I asked him, trying not to let Eleanor hear. Just when we got the perfect life together. Suddenly Oberon leaped up, so suddenly that I thought something had happened to him. Oh, Grandma Asian Aaron, I love you, he said. What? We have a back exit, a cellar, an escape route. My grandma Asian Aaron built one centuries ago during the wars of the Camelosians, just in case he ever needed it. I remember asking him about it. If I'm right, it should lead directly to the swamp. Isn't that worse? I asked. If the crowds are here, they must be there as well, surely. You can't stay here, said Oberon, his face caught in the starlight, and as serious as I ever saw it. Not for much longer. At least this way we have a chance to run. One of us might get away. Head for the Collar Wallabula Club if we get separated. They'll let you in and their defences will be stronger than here. First though, this trapdoor won't have been used in years. It's probably dustier than that Bellabout book Self-Confidence for Dummies. It was. So dusty, in fact, that I could see why I'd never noticed it before. Hidden as it was behind a large pile of books and assorted musical instruments, two of which Oberon picked up as potential weapons. I'd never seen a clarinet or a viola used for such purposes, but I wasn't about to argue. It seems like the wrong thing to do, given that we were the intergalactic peace band, he said sadly. It needs must. Together we moved everything out of the way and nestled together in the gap before the door. Outside the noise grew louder and louder, as if someone was hitting our windows with heavy blunt objects. I couldn't bear it. I knew we had to get out of here, but I had to go first and was secretly determined to push Oberon out of the way. It was me they wanted, not him. Maybe he and my baby would be safe after all. This poor house won't hold forever, said Oberon, taking one last sad look around. It's now or never, Eleanor. Be ready to run. I'll go first, and if there's a crowd there, then they'll catch me, not you. No, I said blankly. Pardon, said Oberon. No, I won't allow anyone else to die in my name. Let me go. It's the off-worlders they want. Tell them you broke in as part of a man. Maybe they won't recognise you in the dark. What do you mean? You have to get out now. I can save you. Let me go first. No. Eleanor, I told you once I would do anything for you. That very much includes this. You saved me from danger once already. They're less likely to hurt their own, I think. Now it's my turn to save you. No, I said. And the quietest voice added, that awful thing that happened to me, that I never told you about, and I never got round to telling you everything. It was exactly like this. Well, no, not exactly. We weren't on Mars, and people weren't trying to kill me. But I met this boy, this human boy, fell in love, lived with his family, thought I was going to have his children. But life got too much for me. It was too noisy, too busy, the pressure became too much. The doctors called it a nervous breakdown, but the odd thing about it was that I wasn't nervous, and I never fully broke down. I just got further and further away from the person I used to be. I craved silence and peace of mind, but I could never find it, no matter how much he did his best to look after me and make things better. Eleanor, the mob, he won't wait for us. I'll have to. He helped me, Oberon. He put me back to who I was. But I kept sliding back to the old me. One day when we were out walking, it got too much. My senses were so on the edge I suddenly couldn't see. I must have walked out, in a daze, into the road, in front of the car. He pulled me back and saved me, but in doing so, he lost his life. He gave it just for me, and I didn't deserve it. That just made the world even louder, madder, more aggressive. Ever since, I've tried to live with the knowledge that someone is no longer around, that the universe is one hero short, all because of me. I try to live my life like it matters, because the only way I can console myself for surviving is that I was meant to do something big and save other people. I can't have survived just for someone else to give their life for me, for it to happen all over again. Oberon's eyes locked with mine. I thought was why you came all this way. To start again. I nodded. I couldn't face seeing the looks on the faces of those who'd known us before the accident. They could see the hole next to me, where he should have been. But they knew that they should be seeing him instead of me. 
a look of pity on kind people's faces and with disdain on those who weren't so kind. For a time I couldn't go out the house in case a car went past and I would scream the place down. I never even noticed them before it happened, but suddenly they were everywhere and everyone I knew was in danger. There are no cars on miles, thank goodness. Nothing to remind me of what was or what might have been. And all of that was lost because of me. So I won't let you go first. I refuse. Tell Eleron you tried and I wouldn't let you if that makes you feel better. Tell anyone what you like. But I can't let you sacrifice yourself for me. I'm not worth it. Oberon said calmly, compassionately. Did it ever occur to you that this accident happened because the driver was in the wrong place at the wrong time and wasn't paying attention to the mad earth woman at the side of the road, that it might have had little or nothing to do with you? But it was. He, he gave his life for me and would be here, be alive if I wasn't there. I felt my eyes leaking again. Did it ever occur to you that this boy gave his life because he loved you and wanted you to live? Because he thought in that instant how unfair it would be that you might be dead through something that wasn't your fault and decided to save you out of love. You shouldn't feel guilty. You should be glad that someone loved you deeply enough to risk everything for you and that it is going to happen a second time. Not because we want you to feel guilty as you carry on living but because you want you to feel loved that we cared enough to give our lives for you because of something that again wasn't your fault and had nothing to do with you. Don't feel bad about what has happened, ever. You've given me the best years of my life. You've shown me happiness I never knew existed. I do what I have to do freely, out of love, and it's such a small price to pay for what you have given me. I don't want you to feel guilty for what might happen to you, ever. I can't talk for my predecessor, but I would guess he felt much the same. You are worth two lives, Eleanor. Maybe millions more, but I know you are worth two. And I will not let you go first. You can't stop me either, puny human. No, I said again, my resolve weaker this time. It is my time to give up my life for someone else. I had a good life. I was lucky till it finally ran out. I got to start all over again and find a future after I got so used to thinking that I would never get on. So few people ever get to meet someone they wanted to spend the rest of their lives with. I got to meet too. I had my baby. My beautiful baby boy I thought I was never going to have. At last it wasn't all for nothing. I get to pass something on. And Oberon, life is what I pass on to you. Oberon grabbed me tightly at those words, as if he was never going to let me go. Throughout our conversation, the sound outside had been growing louder bit by bit, till suddenly we heard an electronic squeal that was loud enough to wake up Oberon, who, dazed and confused, nuzzled his way into our group hug. The crowd were cutting their way in. You were no longer safe. Well, if I'm too stubborn to let you go first, and you're too stubborn to let me go first, then it's a stalemate. We go together, and leave it up to fate, to let whatever will happen, happen. Oberon asked, his wing in my hand. Together, Eleanor nodded, adding, we're stronger together. You're stronger though, you take Eleanor with you. And don't go back for me, whatever happens, just get him to safety. Promise, I hissed urgently. And Oberon leaned into me, pressing his forehead into mine, and held me for what seemed at the time to be forever, and not long enough at all. Then in the next instant, he was gone, with Eleanor in his arms. He was halfway down the tunnel, a flurry of wings and desperation, as he threw himself forward and disappeared from view. I spent a fraction of a second taking in one last look at my house, and bidding it a mental farewell, before sliding down after him, hot on his tail. But already I was too late. The crowd were there waiting, ready for him. He had no chance. I caught a glimpse of Oberon trying to force his way through them, or trying to carry Eleron to safety. Then, overwhelmed by Merasian arts, he fell, Eleron wriggling in his arms. Two ghostly figures came out of nowhere, looking much like the people we had seen on the side of the old endurance fountain, and they smiled at me sadly for a split second as they reached down towards Oberon, their bodies merging with his. And just like that, in the tiniest of split seconds, Oberon was no more. <laughs>